Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today um, and give you an update on the great things that are happening in Liberty. Uh, partnerships are a big thing to me, and they're very significant uh, to the success. And uh, the city greatly values the partnership with the Liberty Chamber of Commerce. And I'll be talking about partnerships more later, but I wanted to say that up front. And actually, what I meant to say before I even started was we missed one elected official who arrived maybe after the list had been formulated, but uh, Clay County Commissioner Luann Ridgeway, if you don't leave today, if you, you don't remember anything else, what I want you to remember, and we actually put some sheets that you could take with you, little things there in the center of your table. There's $280 million of investment going on in our city today, or it will either is or will be going on before the end of this year. If you think about that, just stop for a minute. That's over a quarter of a billion dollars that's being invested in our community right now. That's, that's a pretty significant investment. So I want to give you kind of an overview of, of what makes up that $280 million, some of the good things that are going on. In the area of commercial development, approximately $100 million, as I said, is either going on right now or will be going on. The biggest projects would be um, the Liberty Commons, what you would know as the former Kmart Sears Center. That, <coughs> that entire area will be com completely demolished. And in its place will be put a, a retail uh, destination, house approximately 25 different retail stores that will include restaurants. It's anticipated to ha house a hotel. And that uh, should start construction later this year and be completed and start opening up in late 2016, early 2017. You'll start seeing those retail stores open. B&B Theater, which is currently on that site, it's going to move about 200 yards east to the Blue Jay Crossing um, area, or that area behind CVS, Culver's, and be between there and the high school, all that open acreage, B&B Theaters is going to build a, a totally new facility there, a 13-screen 13, 13 theater, has an outdoor theater, a conference center for 250 people, and will be their corporate offices um, for B&B Theaters. BNB Theaters is no small operator. They're actually the ninth largest theater operator in the United States. Um, and so they're, they're a very significant presence in our community. And then I wanted to make special note of Crowley Furniture. Many of you in the room know that in Memorial Day weekend, actually on my way to church on Sunday morning of Memorial Day, Crowley Furniture was in flames. And it's so much devastation, in fact, that He's essentially rebuilding his entire store. And if you're familiar with Crowley Furniture, he's also opening, opening locations at Lee Summit, mm -hmm. Overland Park. He made the conscious decision. He's been a longtime community partner, and he made a conscious decision. I mean, at that point, it would have been real easy to say, eh, we don't need to rebuild here. We've got these other things. He made a conscious decision to rebuild and reinvest in our community. And so I wanted to make special note of that as well. So $100 million of commercial development. Industrial development, LMV Automotive, which is in the Heartland Industrial Park on 69 Highway, has announced a second phase, an expansion that's actually being constructed now. Uh, it's approximately a $50 million investment. That's on top of an investment they had already made of about $65 million. So that total facility now is about $115 million investment. With it, it'll bring another 165 jobs, additional jobs, and that's on top of the 175, 185 jobs that were already there. So that facility, when it opens and is in full swing uh, with both phases, will have 350, 350 employees under that roof. And that's a very, if you've ever been in there or get an opportunity to go in there, I would highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's ro robotics on steroids. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just machine after machine, and it's, ama it's an amazing place. Heartland Drive, we completed the road, the loop in Heartland Drive, extended that through the Science and Technology Park. <coughs> so we're now ready to um, embark on development of, of the Science and Technology Park. Um, we've been actively 
working on that for, oh gosh, seems like a couple years, but expansion in science and technology is moving a little slower than we had anticipated, but we still believe there's a, there's a good market for it, and this is, we're in the corridor. The corridor between Columbia, Missouri, and Manhattan, Kansas is, is a pretty vibrant corridor for science and technology, per, particularly in the area of animal sciences. And so this will allow us to, um, not only did we put in the road, but we went ahead and extended the water and sewer so it's ready for development. So $50 million of industrial uh, progress in the city. Traffic and roads, that's always a big issue uh, when I hear, uh, when I talk with people on Liberty. Uh, Franklin Street was completed uh, late last year as promised. Uh, it's been a good addition to that uh, historic district. It was a, uh, a new street that was put in and I think the, the neighbors there appreciate it and I know the people that access the square certainly appreciate it. Liberty Drive is in progress right now, a $2 million project. We still anticipate that will be completed by late spring. Um, it's, a, it's gonna be a, a nice addition. That'll be, a, it'll be widened. It'll have a sidewalk on it. If you've ever driven that and know when you pass somebody walking on the shoulder of that, you're at risk, they're at risk. Um, this will allow it to be widened, have a, a nice sidewalk on it, and make another nice gateway to the downtown area. South Liberty Interchange in the last two weeks, you've noticed that they've started moving dirt in, a, in an earnest way. Uh, the um, interchange is a $26 million project. We negotiated Liberty's share of that cost to a little over $4 million, uh, MoDOT, and uh, is paying the majority of the rest of that, but we had to, you always have to negotiate a local participation share, and we negotiated ours down to, to $4 million. That project will be constructed in 2015, 2016, should be completed in late 2016. Essentially what they're gonna do is, in stages, they're gonna completely disassemble that interchange and completely rebuild it to be something totally different than it is now. It'll provide a much safer on and off access. Uh, if you're familiar now, you come on in the speed, in the, in the fast lane rather than the, or in the acceleration lane rather than in the, um, the right hand lane like you would customarily on most interchanges. It will also be looped much better to connect with South Liberty Parkway and provide much better access to significant uh, truck traffic accessing the Ford plant. So that will be enhanced as well. And then South Liberty Parkway. As you know now, that terminates at Withers Road. Um, so it connects the, in the interstate to Withers Road. This second phase will connect from that termination point, Withers Road, all the way to M291 on the east side of the city. So that's about a two and a half, a two and a half miles of roadway, the four lane parkway as you see uh, that's out there today. It essentially will connect a four lane interstate on the west side of our city to a four lane state highway on the east side of our city. We think it's a significant <coughs> traffic corridor. We have great hopes that it's gonna relieve uh, traffic on Kansas Street. We believe there's about 10,000 residents in the City of Liberty that lived in the southeastern southeastern corridor of the city. So rather than if you live in Clay Woods or any of that area, the way you access the interstate going to or from your home is Kansas Street. Well, this will provide you an alternate access and so we, we hope there'll be a significant traffic relief as well as it opens up almost a thousand acres of what's currently landlocked uh, acreage for development and, and the vision is for that to be commercial development along the face of the parkway, residential and business park behind that and, and then some industrial park even behind that as you move further and further away from the parkway. So there's a thousand acres there that uh, provides great opportunity for development. The construction on that project should start late this year um, and should be completed uh, hopefully by the end of 2016. Our goal is to complete the parkway in approximately the same time that that interchange is completed at I-35 or the South Liberty Parkway and I-35 um, so that we have a good high functioning uh, traffic corridor there. We don't want to open the parkway before we have the interchange completed. Um, so I, we think we'll coordinate that pretty well and that will be a, a good, good addition to our city. <coughs> so $50 million in road projects are going to be going on during the month, during the year 2015. And then infrastructure. 
We made a decision a couple years ago. We have all of our wastewater treated by the city of Kansas City because of double digit increases that we saw no, no uh, opportunity in the foreseeable future that was going to be anything less than double digits. In fact, if you read in the Kansas City Star within the last month, they notified all the customers in the city of Kansas City that they should anticipate 12 to 15 percent <coughs> rate increases annually for, for many years to come while they're addressing EPA problems in, in their waste system. So we decided and, and uh, had a bond, bonding pass to build a $75 million wastewater treatment facility and update the, conve the conveyance, uh, the pipelines basically, to that facility so that we can um, basically control our own rate structures and also control our own growth. Uh, another issue we were having with Kansas City is there was no assurance how much we were going to be able to allow to, how much more affluent we were going to be able to pump to them. And so, of course, if your sewer system is limited, then your ability to grow and develop is, is limited as well. So this facility should provide us growth potential for a, what we anticipate to be at least 50 years into the future. And that it's being designed so that it can be expanded, but um, this will be a, a great addition to our city and it'll give us rate stability. We believe once this plan is up and running, uh, we anticipate the rates will be much more in line with what cost of living increases will be, certainly single digits. Um, and we see in, in the foreseeable future, uh, maybe even the possibility of of rate increases that are, are below the consumer price index once we get past the initial phase of opening the plant up. So it'll be a great addition to our city. So $75 million in, in critical infrastructure. We've contracted with Goodwin Brothers Construction out of St. Louis. They're in the final phases. Now this is a design build project and I won't go into all the nuances of what that means other than to say you work cooperatively with the contractor to, to design what the project looks like. What you typically have seen in the past is you work with architects, they draw out a project, and then you take it to a bid to a contractor and they build it to the specification of the engineer or the design. Well, the problem you end up with there is the construction folks say, well, I don't know what the hell your engineer was thinking about, but we can't build it that way. <laughs> you know, So change order for you know, a million dollars because we can't do what your engineer said. This prevents all that. It's a collaboration, so we, we agree. Here's, the, here's what the cost of the plant's going to be. They agree up front that they will build the plant based on very specific specifications. Now, there can be design changes as we go, and we all agree. And in fact, one we are talking about right now is the original, I, the original thought was that this plant would be loaded, located off of Old 210 Highway, very near, if you're familiar with where the animal shelter is. Well, after talking with the construction uh, Goodwin Brothers, they brought an alternate plan that said, well, if you move this a little further west, A, we may not be at, as much at risk to be in the floodplain. We had, we had planned to build it up out of the floodplain. They said, rather than the expense of building it up out of the floodplain, if you move it west, you don't have to endure that expense. We think maybe there's also some opportunities related to pumping stations. You have to, I'm getting into the engineering parts now, but you have to put in a lot of pumping stations to move wastewater around the city and said, we think you can save some costs there. So with that, and then the, <clears throat> the issue of funding $75 million, we were actually able to get state, state revolving funds, SRF funds, that are, subs there's an interest rate subsidization of, uh, those funds. So if you can qualify for that, there can be a su significant savings to your project. Well, the issue was the state of Missouri had never done a design build project and authorized state, state revolving funds. So we had to go through quite a bit of additional work to convince them and for them to get comfortable with a design build project and then fund it. And so it's delayed the project a little bit, but the good news is we believe over the life of the project it's going to save probably $40 million in debt cost uh, just by us being able to get that, those SRF funds with the subsidized interest rates. So it was certainly a worthwhile um, delay. We still believe the project will start construction at the end of this year and be open by the <coughs> end, of, end of 2016, which was our original commitment. So that's, uh, we're, we're still on track. 
It's a little bit of a compressed schedule, but everybody still believes that it can be done and delivered. Revitalization of the downtown area. $5 million that have been uh, earmarked for this. The voters approved the funding in November of this past year. Um, just now in the final phases, in fact, we've, we've assembled and contacted all the folks. About 12 citizens will sit on a downtown task force to define and help us plan what this revitalization is going to look like. There, there are basically two key components to it, the infrastructure underneath the street or subterranean. Uh, so Liberty was incorporated in 1829 and much of that infrastructure down the square may have started getting built in about that time frame. Um, so the, the subterranean project will be a significant piece of that and then the streetscape. We expect to completely redo the streetscape and so we'll work with this, uh, the recommendations from this task force. It's made up of representatives of Historic Downtown Liberty, Inc., uh, the Historic District Review Committee. Uh, there's representation from county government. There's a City of Liberty official, a number of merchants or property owners around the square. There are a couple, there are a few citizens that don't have direct interest in the city, but have very, very keen interest in what our downtown looks like. So they'll be, they'll be guiding how that $5 million is spent. And then you see uh, from time to time there are some projects going on downtown. In fact, on the north side of the square, uh, next to Whiteside Jewelry, that building has gotten a facelift. We have a 350, it's called a 353. Basically, it's a tax abatement program. If you invest in your property, then we'll abate the property taxes on that to reimburse you over however long it takes. Whatever you would have normally paid in property taxes, if you make a $100,000 investment and you pay $10,000 in property taxes, will we'll abate your taxes uh, until you are reimbursed for those improvements. It's making a really significant difference to how the downtown square is looking and it really it encourages merchants to and property owners to enhance the value of their properties uh, which brings businesses which which elevates everyone else's values in the square. So that's been a very worthwhile project. So just to recap, $150,000 in development, $50,000 in roads, $50,000 or $75,000 in the wastewater treatment plant and facilities, and $5 million, I think I'm saying thousand, millions, $150 million, $50 million, $75 and $5 million. So $280 million, say, either underway now or will be underway by the end of the year, investments that are going to happen in our community um, very soon. And that's, that's significant. That's I can't emphasize how significant that is. <clears throat> you might remember from last year, just to kind of give you a further perspective on that, last year we were talking about investment in our community of about 390 million, so if you took those two together, we've had about 670 million dollars of investment since 2013. Last year we were talking about 260 million dollar stamping plant that came online in 2013. Um, we're talking about 30, 35 million dollars in highway projects that were completed in the last two years. Flintlock flyover, I-35, M-291 interchange. We were talking about uh, development projects. I mentioned earlier the LMV project um, up in uh, Heartland Meadows. About 67 million up there. Holland 1916, another 13 million and Rock 10 in the industrial park off of Brown Street, another 15 million. So that was $130 million that I was talking to you last year of projects that were, that were completed, $260 million of Ford stamping plant, and then this 280 million. So we're talking over half a billion dollars of investment that have gone to this community in the last two to three years. And uh, some of those some of those pieces that we talked about today will be getting wrapped up in year four in 2016. So um, let's say I don't want to confuse you with too many numbers. Remember the 280 million, that's what's going on right now. But $670 million since 2013. That's a, that's a pretty significant investment in our community and growth in our community. Well, the one piece that's missing from that all, you didn't hear me say anything about residential development. That's the piece that's missing. 
and I can't emphasize enough how, how hard we're working on that. And I might mention on the other projects too, for every project we announce up here or talk to you about, there are probably two or three other projects that we worked hard on that for one reason or another didn't, didn't work out. Either the investor decided, nah, we'll go to a different community or we're not gonna do that project. So there's a lot of work that goes on that never sees the light of day. We are working very diligently to correct the lack of residential uh, development in our city. In fact, there are two multifamily developments in various stages uh, in the approval processes now. One is completely through the approval process, and they're working on the final stages of uh, getting their investors lined up. Uh, and the second one's pretty far along in the planning and zoning process. So those are two significant multifamily pro uh, projects. We're working about 250 uh, with the developer for about 250 acre development in the city of Liberty. I can't talk about the specifics of that because I don't want get to get out ahead of when they want to make their announcement. But that could be a very significant single family development that will be in the city of Liberty. And recall the, the acreages that we have, about 1,850 acres. Um, I had that broken down so you kind of have a better feel for that around Liberty North High School. So on the northern quarter of the city, there's about 700 acres up there of greenfield developable land. South Liberty Parkway, the phase that's currently completed, there's about 200 acres along the parkway now. And the reason you're not seeing development there, I believe, is there's not been enough critical mass of traffic to start that commercial development and get that going. With the completion of the parkway, <clears throat> remember I said that would open up another 1,000 acres. Actually, it's about 950 acres. <clears throat> That's what's all that acreage between Withers Road and M291 now. So if you take those critical areas, that's, uh, that's what comprises this 1,850 acres of, of available land that's in very good access, will have very good access to roads, uh, to a metro, to a you know a shopping metropolitan area, so that it's prime area for development. And um, I hope, and you should expect, that when I stand in front of you next year, we're talking about some pretty significant residential development. Um, so we'll hold that good thought. But but we are very cognizant of the fact. You know, I think we're doing uh, pretty good in the areas of commercial development, uh, industrial development doing pretty good. We've, our road system is in pretty good shape and we're enhancing that. This is the component that we need to, to add to, to get everything uh, up to snuff where it should be. In relation to, to getting this going, uh, I, re I appointed a residential task force. Councilman Watt was one of the members of that and maybe some others here in the room. They came back with nine specific recommendations of what we needed to do to get residential development going in our community. We've already implemented, I believe, three of those recommendations. One was to look at and make sure our processes for applying and actually getting your, all your permits was as streamlined as possible, and we believe we have probably the, the, the best, the most streamlined process in the metropolitan area now. We reviewed and looked at our fee structure, how our fees for inspection fees, permitting fees, et cetera, how we lined up with other communities to make sure we were at least competitive if not beating those communities. And then we <coughs> started wanting to open communication lines with significant developers in the community so that uh, they, knew Liberty, they knew Liberty was here. We've, we've had one open house. We had 22 developers uh, attend that open house and these are developers who are building prominent developments throughout the metropolitan area. I mean, they're, they're some of the, the largest home builders in Kansas City metropolitan area were at this open house. And many of them were very surprised. Gosh, I didn't know you had all of this, this available up here. And so we're starting to see a lot, get a lot of attraction, get a lot of traction with several of those, those developers. So again, I hope to be standing here talking about uh, several significant residential developments a year from now and you hold my feet to the fire that you should expect that as well because that is a piece that, that we need to um, pick up the pace on. Well we're doing all of this we we're always um, focused on quality of life you know you can grow and grow and grow and be 
be really good about that, but if you're, quality of, if you're sacrificing the quality of life, what's the point? So that's a, that's a big component with us. Um, we have the, uh, the Liberty Community Health Action Team, or LCHAT. It's what you'll normally hear that referred to. That's a partnership with the city, the school district, the hospital, Clay County Public Health, focused on programs, activities, and opportunities to improve the health and well-being of all the citizens in our community. This is a citywide effort, and if you plug into it one way or another, um, I would encourage you to plug into it one way or another and, and, and keep your antenna up about the possibilities to that. Parks improvement. Um, we've got a parks improvement planning project. We're engaging a, um, a contractor to work with us to look at three of our parks in the city, City Park, Bennett Park, and Ruth Moore Park, make some significant improvements and upgrades in those parks. I think uh, Janet Bartnick, our parks director, refers to our parks sometimes as they're kind of tired. <laughs> That's probably kind, but, <laughs> but at any rate, we'll be looking to um, work with that contractor on, on things that we need to upgrade those parks and, and provide some green space for folks to, uh, to enjoy. We've also just recently, we always keep our eyes open and ears open, so if you're aware of something, we had a resident bring an opportunity to us in the Arthur edition, which is in one of the historic areas uh, just south and east of the square, um, who said, you know, hey, there's a property here. We could maybe, uh, if we do this right, we could build a neighborhood park. Well, we started looking into the possibility, and um, we've acquired a significant parcel, and we're in the process of finalizing acquiring a second parcel that's adjacent to it, and that will allow us to build a pocket park. I don't know, we've never really talked about the size, but I believe it's probably a quarter to an acre. It would be like a neighborhood park. So if you see something like that, pick up the phone and call somebody at City Hall, call Janet Partnick, our parks director. Those are the kind of things we really, we really like to try to incorporate into the city and make it a more livable, livable community. Trails and Greenway Master Plan, there are trails in the city. We want to formalize that process, get it ready so that we can actually start constructing some of these projects. And as we work and talk with developers, we want to incorporate that into our discussions with them as part of their project to put these trails and greenways into their developments. And then the community center that you're in here today, we're always making upgrades. There's a lot of equipment that's going to be added to the health facility downstairs in the very near future. Um, may already be down there. I know we've, we've approved the, the acquisitions. So those are all things, and I'd, I'd encourage you to take advantage of the community center as much as you can. Uh, we have a 600-seat th theater here, and there's a lot of things going on between things the city puts on, the school district puts on. It's rented privately at a lot of things. The Liberty Symphony has performances in there. There's a lot of opportunities to take advantage of this facility. We passed a tourism or transient guest tax. We found we were about the only city in Kansas City that wasn't taking the opportunity as people checked into hotels in our community to, to, to uh, collect a hotel tax. And in fact, the city of Gladstone has a hotel tax, but they don't have a hotel in their city. <laughs> <laughs> so as we already have several hotels, and as I mentioned earlier, we, ex we expect a pretty significant hotel to be built in the Liberty Commons area. This will provide funding uh, to expand festivals, attractions, special events, allow us to start putting up more public art. You've seen a little bit of public art, and we'd like to do more of that in the city. Uh, and then the cultural attractions, helping things like the Liberty Symphony, the Liberty Chorus, the Liberty Youth Chorus, Corbin Theater. All of these are community partners that we may be able to help if it's related to tourism and attracting new people to the city of Liberty. And and attracting you and I to the, to the various events as well. We've been, I just call it proactive governing. Um, we've got quite a bit of accountability. We have a budget committee. Uh, we set that up six years ago now. Gosh, I guess that's right. Six years ago, I chair the budget committee. I was chairing the budget committee when it was first set up and and still chair the committee in there, and there are two council members that serve on that with me, two of the eight council members. And then we work shoulder to shoulder with city staff, kind of getting down a little bit. It's not micromanaging, at least 
I hope they would say it's not micromanaging, but it's, it's more of a collaboration, let's say working shoulder to shoulder, to understand what's in the city's budgets, what do the city, you know, and the, the city staff has the perspective of, uh, of professional perspective of what, what's needed and how we, how we administer a budget. And then you get the elected officials in there who part of the reason we're there is because we're there to represent how do you want the city money spent and accounted for. That committee meets mm, at a minimum once a month, probably meets 100 hours over the course of a year in various meetings to put together the budget, administer the budget, look through various opportunities, um, bond refinancings, et cetera. We have a citizens oversight committee for any capital spending that we do. It goes to this citizen committee and they make sure that whatever mechanism put that funding in place, whether it was a a capital, uh, a sales tax related to roads or sales tax related to parks, public safety equipment. They make sure that the funding source, whatever we're spending that money on, is consistent with what the voters voted for that money to do so that we're not doing a, the, the classic bait and switch um, where you're told your money's being going to be spent for one thing and it's actually going somewhere else. So that's, that's regulated by the citizens. They actually review and send their recommendations before it ever gets to the city council. A lot of task force, we've had a utilities task force. They were actually the ones who suggested we take over uh, operating the water plant, which we did several years ago. And now there are one of their other rock recommendations were to start considering taking over the wastewater treatment facility, which we're now in the process of doing. This downtown revitalization task force, uh, residential task force, as these task force make recommendations, we take to heart that those recommendations, there's, a, there's the expectation that we're going to implement those recommendations. This was, wasn't just window dressing or making somebody feel good about, you know, we'll, we'll address it and then when the report comes in, we'll put it on the shelf. So we meet with those task force. Sometimes we'll meet with them in follow up. Uh, sometimes we engage members from those task force then to um, to work with this as we start implementing one or more of those recommendations. But that, that creates the expectation and, and we hear from those folks if we don't implement what they suggested. And then communications, you can see here we're on Twitter, Facebook, um, all the <laughs> YouTube. I'm, I'm uh, challenged in some of those areas so <laughs> and I'm reminded of that by staff from time to time. <laughs> And then partnerships. As I mentioned at the start of the meeting, we really, we really um, value the partnerships that we have. Uh, we have a group that meets once a quarter and a lot and several times more than that during between the quarters in smaller groups. What I call the big four, which is the City of Liberty, William Jewell College, Liberty Public Schools, and Liberty Hospital. And we meet to talk about what are we doing and the what we've really been trying to emphasize on is what are things, what are services that each of us provides to, eat, to you, the constituents, and each of us provides it in a silo. Is there opportunities for us to provide some of those services if we would just all put our resources together rather than duplicating that, those resources two or three times? Can we put those resources together and deliver that same service to you much more efficiently? So that's what this first group, what I call the big four, uh, is really focused on, um, as well as just making sure there's always an open line of communication so we can help each other in, in the various, uh, various ways that, that uh, each group is expected to serve the community. We have community partners. I um, should get the list here of some of the examples, but this would be Community partners would be like Corbin Theater, the Liberty Symphony, uh, the Liberty Chorus. Uh, those, are, those are partners that we intentionally support and help. Uh, business partners would be uh, Clay County EDC, the Liberty Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Liberty Economic Development Corporation. Um, <coughs> Kansas City Area Development Corporation, Historic Downtown Liberty Inc. So those would be some examples of folks that we work with there. Boards and commissions, I'm going to ask here in a minute for all boards and commission folks to help me out. Volunteers, we have folks that help us in all areas. We have a cemetery committee that meets once a month 
uh, when the cemetery was uh, desecrated. Gosh, that's been a number of years ago now, and that committee has remained in place and, and meets monthly to, uh, to keep the city cemetery looking nice and something that we're proud of and as opposed to kind of s something that's fallen in disrepair. Intergovernmental relationships um, with, we're working with the city of Kansas City now to develop the possibility of a, of a um, recreation district working with Clay County commissioners to, to re-engage with, with Clay County and the City of Liberty. Um, Mid-America Regional Council, Clay County Senior Services, Clay County Health Department. We try to work with all of those intergovernmental partners. And the state legislature, that's the last one I'm gonna mention is, as you heard in my bio, I was on the city council for 14 years and I'm just now finishing my second year as as mayor. So I've been in city government now for 16 years and in the last two years we've been more engaged with the state legislature than the sum total of our engagement with the state legislature for the 14 years prior to that. We make regular visits as in go down on a Tuesday and stay at two days and come back on a Wednesday afternoon and then during that time we're talking to House and Senate committees, subcommittees, uh, representatives and senators about s bills that are specific to the City of Liberty or bills that are in the legislature that are going to impact our city either positively or negatively and make sure they understand how we feel uh, the impact, how we feel about the impact of those bills uh, will have on our city and our citizens. So we've spent a lot more time and I will say the legislators, we've had a good relationship with uh, Representative Neff last year, Representative King this year, Senator Sylvie, um, Representative Carpenter, I can go down the list. Uh, we, work with, we work with a lot of folks down there and it makes a difference. It, it really makes a difference to have your voice heard. Well, before we go to that, I wanna introduce I apologize, I'm running along here, but I do want to introduce the city staff because <clears throat> what's enabled me to stand up here and talk uh, in large part is to the city staff. So if I say their names, I'd appreciate if you'd stand and if you just say what your title is. Uh, Kurt Winson. City Administrator. Dan Estes. And stand and stay standing, please. <laughs> Shauna Funderburg. Mike Schneider, Fire Chief, Jim Simpson, <laughs> John Mills, Fire Division Chief, Karen Johnson, Economic and Business Development Manager, Sarah Cook, Public Relations Manager, Jen Houston, Public Relations Specialist, Tony Sage, <laughs> IT Services. Andy Knoll, Assistant Public Works Director, Catherine Sharp, Planning and Building Manager, Janet Bartnick, Parks and Recreation, <laughs> Amy <laughs> Brusvin, Human Resources Director. These are the people on the city staff that, that, that make things <coughs> happen in your city. second group I want to please stay standing I want to add to that is the elected <laughs> officials I feel like we have a pretty high functioning city council you have some that do a lot of, of um, territorial type stuff but uh, Jeff Watt I'm city councilman here in the third ward which is the southwest part of the city Gene Gentry city councilman in the fourth ward which is the southeast quadrant of the city so if you would, please give these folks a hand because they're what makes <laughs> they're, they're what makes this job of giving you a state of the city very, very enjoyable to do. They, they do a lot of great work for the city. So with all of that, we've got a really bright future. $280 million of projects going on in the city take those little sheets there so you'll uh, later if you want to refer back to those new businesses like say 25 30 retail locations just in Liberty Commons alone new jobs at least 165 new jobs in LMV and actually 
quite a few more jobs sprinkled throughout the city. The new transportation improvements, the interchange on the, on the west side of the city, South Liberty Parkway completed all the way over to M291. With the construction of the wastewater treatment plant, we have more control of our cost, your, what you pay for treatment of wastewater, and the growth in our city. And then the upgraded downtown infrastructure and streetscape, basically the heart of Liberty since 1829, actually 1822 when Liberty was first founded. Uh, so those things are, are all uh, key. So I'm going to end the presentation there. And I, again, I apologize for going along. It's, it's uh, hard not to be passionate and really excited about what's going on in Liberty. And, and I hope you, you get a sense of that as well and, and see that as you go around our city. I'm available for questions now or if you want to approach me later because you need to go, I understand. But uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today.